The Braves got off to a hot start in Chicago despite the cold weather. Hopefully we get the rest of this series in, but to come and break everything down with me, have a special guest in Sean Anderson from the CHGO White Sox podcast. Joining me on today's episode to talk about the Braves and the White Sox. We'll get into all that on today's episode of Locked On Braves, so let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, where we cover your favorite Atlanta sports teams each and every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on social media at Shortstop of All. Also, make sure you check out my written work over at Bravestoday.com. Make sure you follow the podcast on social media at Locked On underscore Braves. Send in any questions, comments, or feedback that you have for the podcast. If you're new and watching this on YouTube, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. We're approaching 10,000 subscribers. If you've already done that, hit that thumbs up button so other people can see the podcast and hopefully join us here at Locked On Braves. Thanks for all my everydayers out there supporting Locked On Braves. Continue to let me know down in the comments section below. Today's podcast, very special one. Looking forward to this conversation of Sean with Sean Anderson, the host of the CHGO White Sox podcast. You want to know anything going on with the White Sox, or really they do all Chicago sports over there, make sure you go check them out. They do a great job with the podcast. So looking forward to my conversation with Sean, just breaking down the series, but also talking about the moves this offseason between the Braves and the White Sox, obviously uh, getting Aaron Bummer, signing Ronaldo Lopez, all of that, getting his thoughts on those two guys and just the rest of this series for the, between the Braves and the White Sox. So without further ado, Sean, thanks so much for joining me on today's podcast. Come talk a little Braves or White Sox. I know kind of talking beforehand that they're both in different places right now, unfortunately. <laughs> and and I hate that, too, because I live in Birmingham. I watch the Barons, so I see a lot of these players come out or come up. Luis Robert is one of the most gifted players I've ever seen play in a Barons uniform. So he is one of my favorite players to watch. But uh, these two clubs right now, Sean, they're they're definitely going in different directions. Yeah, I think the best news for you, at least, is the fact that the White Sox have kind of revamped their farm system. So Birmingham's looking a lot better than I think it has in the past five years. They should have some uh, starting pitching on that team, which I don't think they've had in a long time. But yeah, absolutely different directions. You had nine players get a hit in the first six innings. I don't think I've ever seen that in baseball. I mean, that's truly spectacular. Congratulations. You guys really know how to put the wood on the ball. I mean, it's just <laughs> great to watch. <laughs> yeah, I wish no, I could uh, have that. Yeah, I mean, this this Braves lineup, you know, as everybody I know listening to this podcast knows, it's very good. And they did that mm -hmm. a lot last year where everybody in the lineup had a hit up and down. It is, in my opinion, you know, it's right up there with the Dodgers, if not better. Obviously, I'm biased. So uh, I'm going to say the Braves are better and, and have a deeper lineup. But I mean, Orlando RC was an all-star last year. He's off to another hot start. He's batting eighth in this lineup. You know, Jared Kelnick, uh, once former top prospect, hasn't gotten going. He's batting ninth in this lineup and is off to a good start. So we're definitely blessed over here for the Braves. Hopefully the White Sox can get back to that. Like I said, they're they're one of my favorite AL teams to watch when, you know, they've got they are good and have those good players coming through, but it is a bit of a rough watch at the moment. But these two teams, Sean, hooked up in the offseason a little bit on some big trades. The Braves offloading some players, clearing up some roster spots to get Aaron Bummer. Braves also went out and signed Ronaldo Lopez, who you know, obviously came up with the White Sox. Braves want to turn him into a starter. Let's start there. We're, we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon, so and it's probably not going to come out till Wednesday morning. So we may get to see Ronaldo Lopez in his first start with the Braves, but Give me just your thoughts on Ronaldo Lopez, kind of his career path with the White Sox, you know, coming up as a starter, moving to the bullpen where he's looked very good, and now what the Braves are trying to do and turn him back into a starter. Yeah, in the first rebuild, it was started off when the White Sox, in, and, and it was started off when Chris Sale was traded, but a part of those trades, along with moving Jose Quintana to the north side, it was Adam Eaton going to the Washington Nationals, and a part of that package was Lucas Giolito, who ended up being our ace on an AL Central winning team in 2021, and Reynaldo Lopez. And Lopez was kind of a thought after piece. Maybe he'll be a starter. Maybe he'll be a reliever. We'll really have to see what he develops into. And for a team that was rebuilding, he showed a lot of promise. He started in 2018 and 2019, gave them 180 innings in both of those seasons. And then when COVID happened, that 
season got shortened down, they thought Lopez could give us much more if he was a guy that instead of throwing 95 through six innings, he was throwing 98, 99 in a bullpen situation where instead of throwing 80 pitches, he's throwing 20 and he can go max effort into those pitches. But a big thing that also happened to Ryan Lopez was he got LASIK eye surgery and he talked about being on the mound and not being able to see the catcher. So when you see the gaudy walk numbers, it might make sense that, oh, this is a person that can't see. And the White Sox really never gave him that chance to go out and be a starter. You could see him be an extremely effective pitcher. 302 ERA, 131 in a third innings pitch and a 112 whip since getting LASIK. Like he has been a different pitcher out there. He seems very confident in his stuff. He seems very composed. And I think it's very smart of Alex Anthopoulos to try to stretch this guy out because if it doesn't work, hopefully he doesn't get a major injury where he's out for the season and you can reel back his innings and he can be a dominant multi-inning or just dominant reliever for you. Uh, You saw the run that he went on with Cleveland. He was absolutely spectacular. So I'm absolutely intrigued and honestly jealous that the White Sox didn't go out and get Reynaldo Lopez because I was uh I put together an offseason plan where I had the Sox signing Reynaldo Lopez for three years 33 million and I think you guys signed him for three years 30 so I think you even got a better deal than I thought was even possible so uh all the credit to uh AA there yeah and it's one of those things like you said I mean give them a chance as a starter see what can happen And if things don't work out, you know you have that dominant reliever where that velocity is going to tick back up and possibly a multi-inning reliever, which I think are becoming more and more valuable in Major League Baseball right now. So it's just – it really is a good option. As you said, good idea by Alex Anthopoulos. As we as Braves fans know, one of the best GMs in all of baseball to just go out there, take a shot on a guy, and see if what he's learned since having LASIK – I didn't know that part, so thanks uh, for adding that information, but – Uh, You know, maybe he can go back to the rotation now and stretch out where he was at one point, a workhorse guy, 180 innings in a year. Not expecting that this season, but maybe could get to that over the course of this three-year deal if things work out. But, you know, if the Braves rotation stays healthy, you're going to have Strider, you're going to have Freed, you're going to have Sale, you're going to have Morton. It's not like the Braves are counting on Lopez to be that guy in their rotation. And if it comes postseason time and all those guys are healthy, then, as we mentioned, he becomes a really dynamite pitcher in the bullpen. The one thing I, I watch with Lopez and what I've kept an eye on in spring training, which can't always take too much stock into that, and what I'm really curious to see if he gets to play or gets to start in this White Sox series if we get these games in, is what does that velocity look like? Because for me, Sean, just an outside perspective, what made him so much more effective going to that reliever role? I mean, it was 98, 99, 100. Mm-hmm. You know, so far in spring training as a starter, we haven't seen that. And I'm curious if he can still maintain that effectiveness throwing 94, 95, 96 with that slider. What else kind of does he develop off of that? I think the command has really grown from the last time he was a starter. And I think the two secondary pitches have grown a lot in that reliever role. You can be truly, you know, I'm going to use, you know, 10 max effort fastballs and I'll crank my slider up to 89. But he is a guy that has a third pitch. His changeup was really Uh, effective when he was a starting pitcher. So I think even though he might be at 95, I think that he has shown the ability to locate that changeup, a comfortability with that changeup. And I think that he isn't just a fastball slider guy where that fastball velocity needs to be 98, 99. I think that he could be a three pitch pitcher because we saw a lot of starts where he was going seven, eight, nine innings. I mean, he had a 14 strikeout game with the White Sox in uh, 2019. Like he had some really dominant outings and I think truly it's just now he's 30 years old he's grown I think he's become more comfortable in being in the major leagues because he was so young when he first came up with the Sox and he was still developing and obviously everyone just was kind (laughs) of shook by COVID I think he's truly found his footing and I don't think the Reynaldo Lopez of old would have struggled like he did to open 2023 where he didn't have great velocity and got hammered in the White Sox bullpen. I think he had an ERA around 443, got traded to LA and then got traded to Cleveland. Like I think that would have thrown him off a ton when when he was younger, but now you can see when he's 29 years old and he reaches Cleveland, he's not worried about everything else around him. He can really block that out. And I think he had 13 games where he didn't give up an earned run. So I think this Braves organization giving him the confidence to be a starter, I think could be huge 
for him just as a because you need that mentality as a starter i think he can really develop that mentality and be a three pitch pitcher where you know velocity isn't that important because he's shown the ability to command his main two pitches that fastball and slider and if he can control that change up i think he can be a starter with the the pitch mix alone yeah, that was the other key for me, Not, you know, maintaining that velocity deeper into outings, which he hasn't done as much. But as we talked, he he went pretty deep and then threw a lot of innings earlier in his career, but also just being able to control that changeup to help him get through an order two, three times in an outing, I think it's going to be very key for Lopez. So hopefully we get to see him pitch on Tuesday night. Hopefully things go well and he can stick in this rotation for a while and give the Braves some more depth there. Next, I want to get into the trade of the offseason with Aaron Bummer and the Braves sent about a bajillion players over there and some players that I'm really intrigued and a lot of Braves fans are really cheering for. Michael Soroka at the top of that list. We'll talk about all of that here next. March Madness is here, which means the biggest moments in college basketball are, are happening as well. Be a part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball. Prize picks even offers injury insurance. So if your entry stays in play, even if one of your players gets injured for basketball games, that means if they leave in the first half, don't come back in the second. That player projection won't count against you for the rest of your entry, and it stays alive. Prize picks offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts, and prize picks is really simple to play. I can make picks, my picks and submit them in just 60 seconds. You also got the Major League Baseball season underway, and they have fun options every day there as well. Spencer Strider, again, if we get to play on Wednesday, you can go over there. They'll have a strikeout total for them, and all you got to do is pick more or less. I'm taking more. Uh, <laughs> it's really just that simple. Just pick two to six players or a group of two to six players and decide if you think more or less on certain stats like strikeouts, hits, home runs, and more. Download the app today. Use our code locked on MLB all lowercase for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, download the app today and use code locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with prize picks. All right, Sean, get back into this discussion here. And I want to transition to this offseason trade, uh, the one for Aaron Bummer. The Braves get Aaron Bummer. I like that move, and we can talk about that as well. Guy who, you look at the numbers last year, and they're terrible, but you look at the underlying metrics, and you see a guy that could still be very effective. So I want to ask you up front, what went wrong with Aaron Bummer last year? What should Braves fans be concerned about this year? He's already had two appearances for the Braves this year. Not great. Uh, you know, he gave up the lead in the game on Sunday, the game they lost in Philadelphia. but you know, nothing really getting hit hard from what I saw from Aaron Bummer last year. It's, it's really just about control command can get away from the ties, but gives Braves fans a little bit more insight on Aaron Bummer. What are some issues, some keys that they should be looking for? I mean this in a very respectful way, but I'm very glad that Aaron Bummer is not a white sock anymore. And it's because he was a guy that I love to defend for the exact reasons that you are defending him and it's the underlying metrics and it's the stuff grades out so well. And you see when he finds that control, he can be the best or one of the best left-handed relievers in all of baseball. And that's why when he signed his original extension with the White Sox, we were very thrilled because we thought he would be a mainstay in the bullpen. We thought it was a very good deal, but at the end of the day, Aaron Bummer just can't get results. And I think that's the most frustrating part. If the results start to show up, I think, you know, Braves fans will be head over heels with Aaron Bummer. But if this narrative continues where his ERA is, I think, 13, but if you look at, you know, an XFIP, it's got like a, a 0.38, right? He's a guy as a pitcher, when you're getting 65% ground balls, you need to be able to field your position. And he really doesn't field his position well. I'm not sure if that's just because of his wind up his motion and already lefties are already taken to the other side of the mound right to the third base side so it's difficult for them to field anything in front of them or even to the first base side so those you know easy weak contact that he induces a lot they turn into hits more often than not then he'll walk the next guy and then you know a single gets through and there's a run so he's just frustrating just because he gets the results that you want, he'll have a high ground ball rate, but it just, for some reason, he has the worst luck for any pitcher I've ever seen. So I hope he turns it around and I hope he can be a dominant force for you guys. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad that he's in Atlanta right now. 
Yeah, I mean, that was pretty much the situation on Sunday. I mean, he came in, he got the ground ball, double play, calls was overturned at first base, went from an out to safe, and then four straight singles after that ball. <laughs> he just found a hole to get through. So we've already lived that experience with Aaron Bummer, but hopefully he can get some better results. Now, I want to talk you about the rest deal with of like that. a Castellanos, like a uh, homer off. I'm sorry to cut you off. You won't have to deal with no, like you're Castellanos, gonna... you know, uh, you know, flexing a home run off of him or Trey Turner doing that, right? Like it will just be uh, bleeding singles after bleeding singles after right. bleeding yeah. singles, and it will just be a stab in the heart each time. Yeah, you'd almost just rather it be some sort of monster yeah. shot than just <laughs> these death by a, mil by a million paper cuts, which is what it can be with Aaron Bummer sometimes. But in that trade, the Braves sent Michael Soroka, Jared Schuster, Nicky Lopez, Braden Shoemaker, Shoemaker, and, and Riley Goins. Now, I don't know much about Goins. Hopefully, he works out for you. But for those other four in particular, you know, Jared Schuster, a first-round pick, uh, Michael Soroka, a top pick, who was once a, once a – frontline starter for the Braves before all the injuries hit. Nicky Lopez became a fan favorite last year after coming over from the Royals with the Braves in his short time. Braden Shoemake, I believe he was also a first round pick, but just could never find his way into the Braves lineup. Those are all, you know, very high prospect, talented guys coming up that just could not find a roster spot with the Braves. Soroka, you know, just had one year of control left. Really just couldn't count on him to stay in the rotation and couldn't guarantee him that rotation spot. I think he's the one that a lot of Braves fans are cheering very hard for because, I mean, he was a fan favorite, came up, you know, pitched some big games for the Braves and just had those back-to-back -back Achilles injuries that unfortunately just derailed his career. And I know a lot of Braves fans are cheering for him to get things going. I watched the start on Saturday, you know, a rough first inning there. Then I thought he did a good job settling down, left the game with a win. I'll just give you quickly my analysis of him. The sinker was one of his better pitches before the injuries, and it's he had to overhaul his mechanics to come back to try to prevent injury again. And that sinker is, in my opinion, his worst pitch at the moment. He cannot get it down. It is getting absolutely crushed because he's leaving it up in the zone. But that's just kind of my quick analysis on him for Soroka. But what is kind of your take, you know, White Sox getting hand on him? What are they saying about Soroka? I think Soroka is a great piece for this version of the White Sox to pick up. If they were trading Aaron Bummer for Mike Soroka and this was a contending team, I'd be losing my mind. But the fact that this is a team without any starters, with the ability to give players with so much past performance and talent like Soroka the runway to try to thrive. And you're right about the sinker, but what we've seen in the offseason is is that he's introduced a forcing fastball with more ride that he can throw up in the zone. So I think what he's trying to do is a induce more ground balls and just have guys unsure of whether it's going to be, you know, rising in the zone or if it's going to be having that sink and then just creating weak contact and the White Sox defense behind him can pick up those ground balls and get them easy outs. Uh, but yeah, the, the sinker really wasn't there. And I, I do wonder if he wasn't fully ramped up. I think if he's able to stay healthy, it'll be in interesting to see how he builds and if that velocity increases and then maybe we'll see more sink on that fastball or more sink on that sinker and, and more ride on that fastball and maybe we'll see better results than we did on Saturday. But also there was, I don't know if this was confirmed or not, uh, but apparently in the first inning he was tipping pitches as well, which mm -hmm. will never go well. So uh, if he was tipping pitches and then we saw cleaner innings in the second, third, and fourth, it's it's still a guy that's very interesting for the Sox to use. And it's interesting to see how he'll build up and grow because obviously Braves fans are rooting on rooting Mont because you saw the all-star talent at 21 years old. Um, he's younger than our guys, Mike, um, like Michael Kopech, like Michael Kopech is a huge prospect for us. He's now been moved to the bullpen and Soroka is still, I think a year younger than him. Kopech's 27, Soroka's 26. So you still just think like, this is a player with so much potential left in him. It's great that the White Sox are giving him that opportunity. Yeah. And love it that, you know, he's able to go to a place like that. It was really the best case scenario for both parties. And I think that was kind of you know, what was said when it happened, because I mean, the Braves last year, they had to call on Soroka probably before they wanted to. They probably would have liked him to get more starts at the minor league level before bringing him back up. But the Braves just had so many injuries in their rotation. And then it was kind of this yo-yoing back and forth, which I don't think did him any favors either. But when he got long stretches at AAA last year, I mean, he was really good. Obviously, AAA different than the big leagues. But 
I'm just glad that he's somewhere where, you know, he's going to get a longer leash and be able to, to start as long as he stays healthy. Hopefully he gets it together. I know we just started following each other on Twitter, but you almost, you made me smile because it's exactly what I tweeted during the game on Saturday. I said, I almost wish he would just ditch the sinker and start throwing elevated fastballs because that slider has so much downward break on it. That changeup is so good and has still has so much movement on it that if he can th throw that fastball at the top of the zone with a little bit of rise on it, I think that could help him a lot with that sinker, just not being able to command it down in the zone like he used to be able to. So certainly cheering for Soroka. Schuster, I know he's at AAA uh, right now, you know, back of the rotation type of type of guy, I think. Braden Schumacher to me is the one that's the interesting guy because coming into last spring training, he was competing for the starting shortstop job. And I think defensively he had it. But he just hasn't been able to get there offensively. So he got his first home run in that game on Saturday as well, his first big league hit. So Braden Schumacher's the guy that I think maybe has some potential to maybe perhaps be an everyday player. Yeah, just to add one more thought on Soroka, too. You mentioned the yeah. slider. I, I'm surprised that they haven't uh, taught him a cutter or he hasn't incorporated a cutter into yeah. his mix, too, because the White Sox have done that with Crochet and Kopech, and that's a big uh, philosophy of Brian Bannister, our pitching coach. So if he's throwing a sinker, he's throwing a four seam, maybe his, just, you know, his wrist doesn't pronate the right way and he's not able to get that cut, but he's able to get the cut on the slider. So you know, maybe if if you're able to take a little bit off and get you know that up to 90, maybe he'll get enough movement, but we'll see. It's it give, Hopefully he stays healthy to try to figure all these things out. Uh, but Shoemake, he's a guy that I really overlooked, mainly because he got injured in spring training. And they said, oh, he'll be missing two to four weeks. And this was about you know, two or maybe even a week away from opening day. So we wrote Shoemake off as not being able to make the roster. There was about 43 guys on the White Sox or in the White Sox spring training camp uh, like five days before opening day. So their roster was an amalgamation. And we really weren't sure who was going to make it. And Shoemake was a surprise uh inclusion on the opening day roster mainly because of the injury but also just because of what you mentioned right defensively he had it but he really never showed it offensively and i think the biggest thing that's come clear now that he has been included is he's one of the best base runners on the team so i think what they like about him is the defensive ability and the speed i don't think they're looking for braden shoemake to be a 250 average guy and you know have a great on, on base percentage if he's gonna you know see a hanging uh, slider and be able to pop it out. I think they'd love that. But as long as he plays smart, clean baseball, and so far he has, and he's shown off his speed. Uh, there was a steal by Nicky Lopez. He ends up getting thrown out at second base on Sunday, but Shoemaker was on third uh, and he got to second on a hit and run, or he got to third on a hit and run, uh, tried to steal second, and then Lopez got it through for a single. So he was able to get to third. Uh, then Lopez steals second and Shoemaker advances home. So he basically, you know, quote unquote, stole home. So he showed the base running IQ and the defensive ability so far, and he seems flexible for third, short, second, and first. So it's an interesting inclusion, and so far he's played his butt off. Yeah, I'm glad to see it for him as well. He's somebody I've always kind of just ticketed him for that super utility role, not quite to the Ben Sobris level, but somebody that can play all over the infield. I'm sure he could play corner outfield too if you needed him to, but I just I never have thought that maybe he could stick as an everyday player. But certainly his defense, his versatility, I think is going to keep him on a big big league roster. And if you can ever figure it out with the bat, where I watch a lot of college baseball at Texas A&M, he was one of the better hitters his freshman year in college. I think maybe he has a chance to be an everyday player at some point. So certainly cheering for those two guys. Next, we'll turn our attention to the actual series being played between the Braves and the White Sox. We'll get a weather report from Sean there in Chicago to see if we're going to actually get these games in. We'll talk about that next. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets for your next big event, and you don't have to when you use Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They have killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. That means if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference game time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase see the view from your seat right there before you buy it i don't ever buy tickets anymore without knowing what my view is going to look like you might go to that that other stadium in chicago that has all those poles in the way where you can't see you want to make sure that you are not blocked there and your view is not obstructed so make sure you look at that view 
from your seat when you're buying those tickets on a game time. They give you all in prices, which I appreciate as well. You know exactly what you're paying before you get to check out. I just bought my tickets for this upcoming Saturday's game for, between the Braves and the Diamondbacks on game time. You should too. And when you do, make sure that you use our code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. So download the game time app, create an account, use code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Again, download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Sean, let's wrap things up here. We got, as we're recording this on Tuesday afternoon, potentially two more games in this series. So I'm going to ask you right now, are we playing two games? We're playing one game. We're playing no games. What's it looking like? It looks dreadful right now. It's 49 degrees, and I think that's the highest it will be over the next two days. doesn't look like rain's going to stop until 7 p.m., so we might get a game tonight, but uh, maybe a delayed start around 8.10 instead of 7.10. I think that they play today just mainly because tomorrow the high is going to be 38, and there's likely to be snow. So that doesn't seem like good baseball weather. Uh, poor Ronald Acuna Jr. is going to have to be shivering on second base again tonight, I think. Uh, so, yeah, no, it, it, it looks like I think we'll get one game at least just because the Braves have the ability to return to Chicago, I think, in May when they come to face the Cubs. But I, I think that is really just tricky dynamics there to try to fit in one game. It seems like they'd rather play 161 on the year rather than, you know, make up this game against the White Sox in, in April with just the inclement weather. So I'll, I'll say one, not confident about a second game. Yeah, I think that's kind of where I'm going to. I think if there is a chance, maybe they get one in on Tuesday, just call it on Wednesday. We don't want to be out there playing in cold weather. We've done that in Chicago before, <laughs> and it was an absolute disaster, and it was just everybody get out of there alive. So I don't want to relive that situation early season in Chicago, uh, but hopefully they do at least get one more game in. If they do, it's going to be Lopez, who we talked about a lot. But on the other side of that, Garrett Crochet. And if we get to watch him pitch, he was obviously great on opening day. He's somebody really exciting arm. I talked about the fact that I watch a lot of college baseball. You know, coming out of Tennessee, really good left-handed arm. Uh, big stuff. Saw him in his first start. He was up, you know, 97, 98, really good slider. What can you tell me about Crochet? And we looking at somebody, somebody like Lopez trying to make that transition from the bullpen to the starting role. Yeah, it's very surprising that this has been the journey for Garrett Crochet this year. Uh, in 2023, like in the middle of the season, our CHGO White Sox beat writer Vinny Duber threw out a quote that Garrett Crochet wanted to be a starter. And not in any rude way, I did laugh. And I thought it was hilarious because I'm like, of course he does. Starters get paid more, but he doesn't have the inning space. And you see he maxed out at Tennessee, not even in any you know minor league level, at 60 innings. He hit 54 in 2021 out of the bullpen for the White Sox. So he doesn't have the inning base to be a starter. However, he looked phenomenal and he looks so composed. And I think the biggest thing that Chris Getz has said is that he wants this. And you can see in his demeanor, in his ability to rebound from a bad pitch, that he wants this and even said that he was ready to come out for the seventh inning and take it batter by batter. If Pedro Griffo let him like, he just has that mentality to do it. And again, it's similar to Soroka. You have the ability to give these guys runway because you know, you're not going to be a good baseball team. So why not? You know, if he can make five great starts for you and then you have to manage his arm and his workload that, you know, so be it. But I think it's worth it if he wants it, and especially just with the state of the White Sox, it's absolutely worth it because he's got the most talent on the team. Uh, Eric Fetty even said so. Like He's got the best stuff, and when they named him the opening day starter, uh, Eric Fetty, I think, was thinking it would be him after Dylan Cease was traded, but uh, he kind of conceded to Garrett Crochet and just saying Crochet was filthy, and he was. Uh, as long as he maintains that composure and doesn't give up walks to the Braves if he faces them, I think he'll be effective. He might give up some home runs he might give up some loud contact if he hangs some uh some sliders or if he leaves some fat fastballs but as long as he doesn't walk anyone like he didn't on uh opening day i think he's going to be extremely effective as a starter so as long as they're managing that workload let's see what he turns into yeah that was a big big key for me in that first start no walks and selfishly i have him on a, a deep dynasty team so i'm hoping this transition to the starting role works out because that'd be a big boost there for me personally but I uh, just love love seeing guys like that, you know, have that mentality, want to go, you know, get that job and take it. And again, he looked really electric, one of the better 
outings that I've watched so far this year for Garrett Crochet. So hopefully we get that matchup. If we do get a matchup on a Wednesday for a game three, it'll be Strider for the Braves. Not sure yet for the White Sox. I don't know if you have a lean there of who might pitch a game three if we get it. Uh, yeah, no, no idea. Uh, <laughs> so that was a big topic this off season was who will be the fifth starter for the White Sox. And it seemed like they might be able to get away with having no fifth starter for the first nine games. So if anything, maybe it's Soroka, but that, that seems unlikely. I think that they'll probably go to Kopech. He was extremely efficient on Sunday, uh, throwing 16 strikes on 17 pitches. So maybe they look for Kopech to give them two innings and it's, it's a bullpen game because they did make a free agent acquisition in Mike Clevenger. Um, but he's obviously nowhere ready to be that fifth starter. He wasn't in camp with them. He wasn't in, you know, uh, he, he hasn't had the ramp up that all these other guys have had. So he likely won't be on the team until May. So it, it seems like their fifth starter is in Charlotte right now. Um, Nick Nestrini hasn't started for Charlotte and he seemingly won the job if anyone did in spring training. So maybe it's Nestrini, but facing the Braves, I think it's likely going to be a bullpen game if they play that third game. Yeah, I was going to say it could work out for the White Sox because I don't think we're going to play that game and you don't have to worry about that fifth starter for a little while. But uh, as a Braves fan, I would love to see Strider uh, get that opportunity. Maybe not in those weather conditions, but just love any time that he takes the mound. Sean, I want to thank uh, yeah, you again I think for coming on. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Just, my bad. Strider against this team, he could probably just throw, <laughs> I mean, honestly, 75 fastballs and just see if anyone could hit him. There's no one on this team that could hit 99. So he doesn't have to worry about the curveball that he's working on. Just throw fastballs and he's fine. <laughs> yeah. And that weather, he may have to, because as you saw with more, he was struggling to find that curveball grip yesterday or on Monday as well. But uh, Sean, I want to thank you for coming on. I need to wrap things up here, but thank you so much. Make sure if you haven't, go follow Sean on social media, Sean underscore W underscore Anderson, and check out the chgo white Sox podcast they do a fantastic job over there so sean i want to thank you for coming on but that will do it for this episode of locked on braves subscribe to us on youtube if you're new follow us on social media at locked on underscore braves make sure that you rate review and subscribe to the locked on braves podcast wherever you get your podcast and we'll talk to you next time